Welcome, everyone. We are so delighted to have um, many of you coming back again, having joined us for previous sessions and some of you joining us for the first time. We will get started momentarily, but if you have a moment to uh, change your name on your screen so it uh, says where you're from, that would be great. And um, I think we will go ahead and begin, uh, even as some people continue to join. Okay, so uh, as a reminder, this session is being recorded and your attendance is consent to be recorded. And um, while we are, while speakers are online, please do mute yourself. Just mentioned to rename yourself in the Zoom. And if you have any questions throughout the session, go ahead and put them in the chat. We will try and have the um, somebody answer them in the chat, but all chat, but also bring them up during the question and answer uh, time right after our presentations, but also. Uh, more likely at the very end, we're going to have 15 minutes of questions and discussions. And please, if you will take a moment to answer our post-session survey, that would be greatly appreciated. It really helps us continue to improve. And anybody who answers the survey will get a certificate of attendance for the day. And uh, in the next couple of days, we will go ahead and send you an, a follow-up email that has this recording and all of the uh, references that are provided. The links during the chats will all be included as well as some other helpful information. All right, so uh, again, these are the organizations that are hosting our seminar series. And I just also would like to quickly review throughout the session, we will have a couple of opportunities where we ask you to um, put, give us some input, answer some polls, or uh, provide us some information using Mentimeter. So in the chat function now, and uh, whenever we want you to use the polling, we will... Um, put it in the chat, the link, and so we can practice now. would like you, everyone, please, to answer two questions. The first one is, uh, what, what would you like to, what one word would you like to describe yourself, your profession, and where are you in the world? So if everyone could take a moment to answer that, that would be great. Okay, and while you're answering that, I just want to remind everyone what the objective is of the entire uh, year-long webinar series. We are doing this in order to exchange knowledge on how to plan and build sustainable infrastructure. And we are also using an interactive forum to help uh, convey this information in between specialists and practitioners in the field. And we're also hoping to grow a community of individuals and organizations who are engaged in sustainable infrastructure. And in addition to having this monthly webinar series, we have started a LinkedIn group, which is right here on the screen and also in the chat. We hope that you will join that uh, LinkedIn group in order to stay abreast of uh, new articles coming out, uh, webinar other webinar series, we're gonna hear about one today that UNEP is involved in, specifically related to uh, nature-based solutions. We will also have other um, information for you and opportunities to express your opinions in the LinkedIn group. So please do join. And I'm also happy to announce that we are now starting a library on our website for all of short brief write-ups of the case studies from each of the cases that we're presenting. So our first session on strategic planning had two and those are now up 
and in our library. And again, that link will be in the website and we will also be posting these in our LinkedIn uh, group site. We stay tuned in that group site. We have a, um, a, new, a new course that I just mentioned. And also next week, we're gonna put out a online conference on equitable and sustainable infrastructure from the Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure and Zafness at Harvard on delivering merit and climate resilience. So there's a lot there and please help us build a community to share all this information. All right, so today we are on to the fourth principle of UNEP's good practice principles for sustainable infrastructure. Just to keep everything in perspective, the first three principles that we have discussed over the last few months have focused on early in the project cycle, the upstream planning phase. We looked at strategic planning, uh, systems-based planning, responsive and res resilient, flexible service provision. We also looked at comprehensive life cycle assessments. Now we're coming down for the next three sessions, we're going to be doing more cross-cutting uh, issues. They occur also in the early stage, but also throughout the life cycle. So in today's session, we're going to talk about investing in nature, nature-based solutions. We're going to come back in a month and look at the circular economy and resource efficiency, particularly as it relates to climate, because next month we'll be in the middle of the climate cop. We are then in December gonna look at equity, inclusiveness and empowerment. So we are now in these cross-cutting issues. So for some of you who are more involved at the project level, you might find that these relate really directly to what you're doing, perhaps more so than some of the early planning. Then uh, next year for the first two sessions, we will look at two more financial, uh, and economic topics, and we will finish the series at the end looking at more decision-making issues. So today I'm going to hand over um, the session to uh, Joe, Joe Price in a moment. Uh, it, we are, as I said, looking at nature-based solutions, which is particularly relevant since we are right now in the middle of the virtual aspect of the biodiversity COP out of Kunming, China. So it's very topical today. But before we do this, I want to introduce one of my colleagues, Emily Corwin from Conservation International, to get us started on the polling. Great. Thanks, Liz. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Thanks, everyone, for joining and looking forward to the presentations today. Um, it's a topic close to my heart as the Director of Nature-Based Engineering Solutions at Conservation International and our work on green gray infrastructure. Um, but before I introduce Joe, I want to share, um, it looks like we only have six responses so far on the Mentimeter. So if you, um, oh, no, here we have 49, almost 50. Awesome. You guys are making it here. Um, so this first question, what one word would you use to describe your profession? It looks like we have a fantastic diversity of different pro professions represented um, with maybe engineer, conservation, and environmentalist uh, being most strongly represented. And great to see this kind of cross-cutting uh, diversity of expertise in the room with us. And this is one of my favorite ones to see who's in the room. I know travel has been so restricted um, in the recent months and years. So look at all the people here with us. It looks like Myanmar, US, Bangladesh, France, Lebanon, Ghana. Wonderful. Thank you everyone for joining and for staying up late or waking up early, um, wherever you might be. So with that, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Joe Price. Uh, Joe is a consultant in UNEP's 
Resource and Markets Branch in Geneva, where he's part of a team coordinating the implementation of the UN Environment, Environment Assembly Resolution on Sustainable Infrastructure. Okay, thank you very much, Emily. Um, so as was done in previous sessions, I'll just provide a short overview of principle uh, number four to set the scene for this topic. As Liz mentioned, uh, this, this webinar series is structured around the 10 principles. And so we are looking today at avoiding environmental impacts and investing in nature. So if we look at the next slide, this principle states that adverse environmental impacts from infrastructure should be minimized and natural capital enhanced to the greatest degree possible. Construction should be avoided in areas important for the persistence of biodiversity or having high ecosystem service value. The development of physical infrastructure should seek to complement or strengthen rather than replace nature's ability to provide services such as water supply and purification, flood control and carbon sequestration. And nature-based solutions should be prioritized. So if you look at the infrastructure lifecycle diagram uh, in the next slide, um, as Liz mentioned to this really is a cross cutting issue. It's not only relevant to early um, project prioritization when selecting options for infrastructure services, but also further downstream when it comes to construction on the ground, uh, avoiding environmental impacts is obviously really key here. So if we go into some of the detail of the principles, um, the first part is about protecting and enhancing biodiversity on this next slide. And to do this, um, one way of an important thing to do here is prioritizing brownfield development. So brownfield development means choosing sites that have already been altered from their natural states in order to minimize impacts on biodiversity. And then where greenfield development, i.e. Uh, building in previously undisturbed areas, where that's absolutely necessary, then areas important for the persistence of biodiversity or those with high ecosystem service value should be avoided altogether. So then focusing on the ecosystem services angle in a little more detail on the next slide. Um, it's an interesting, interesting relationship chip here between res resilience and ecosystem services, and there's some interesting interactions between built infrastructure and the surrounding natural environment, because we should consider not only the uh, resilience of the infrastructure, the built infrastructure itself, which may be exposed to certain types of disasters like floods or landslides, but it's also critical to consider the impacts that infrastructure can have on ecosystems and their ability to protect built infrastructure from these floods and other disasters or hazards, um, as well as their ability more broadly to provide ecosystem services that are essential for societies and economies to function. So then for this message, the, the key message, sorry, for this principle, the key message really on the next slide is prioritizing nature-based solutions where possible. Um, and so I won't go into a detailed definition or, or examples of nature-based solutions, as we'll hear more, more on those in the next, from the next speakers. Uh, but nature-based solutions essentially refer to uh, using the services that nature provides already to replace or complement built infrastructure options. Um, and the associated concept here is uh, green-gray infrastructure which is about integrating the conservation uh, or restoration of nature with conventional built infrastructure like uh, concrete dams or roads. Um, and we'll hear a case study on, on this approach in Colombia later on in this, in this session. Um, and the rationale really for prioritizing nature-based solutions is that they are proven to be a cost-effective option. They can create jobs and deliver numerous co-benefits co as well. So I think I'll leave it there and I'll just uh, highlight that UNEP and the Partnership for Environment and Disaster Risk Reduction are offering a massive on, open online course, a MOOC on sustainable infrastructure and, uh, and sorry, so on, on nature-based solutions for disaster and climate resilience. Um, so the link to that can be shared in the chat uh, for anyone that's interested in, in looking more into that course. Um, but for now, I'll hand over on to my next, onto our next speaker, Daisy Hessenberger. So Daisy is a young professional in the Nature-Based Solutions Group at the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN. Daisy collaborates with the various programs, members, partners, and external stakeholders on the development and application of the IUCN Global Standard for Nature-Based Solutions. With a PhD in plant sciences from the University of Cambridge, 
and a background in science, communication and publishing. Her interest and strengths lie in facilitating the benefits that complexity and diversity offer in designing interventions to societal challenges. So Daisy, over to you. Uh, thank you, Joseph. And uh, I'm just gonna start straight off with uh, sharing my slides. Just let me know if there's any issues there. So thank you very much for being here to talk to me or listen to me talk about uh, nature-based solutions and specifically a tool we've been delivering that we think will be very relevant to your field. But why are we talking about nature-based solutions when we've just heard more about biodiversity? And Joseph's given a, as a bit of background there. I think you all know, we all know here the challenges that we face. Uh, it's quite frankly depressing. <laughs> Again, we can lose a lot of hope when we read in the news about the, the, the things our world is, fa are, is facing. At the same time, I hope you've heard some of the statistics, not just uh, now, but in, around you in the media and across your sector on what biodiversity, on what healthy nature can contribute to us. Uh, there's billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars to be uh, saved by using mangroves when it comes to averting flooding damage. And that's only in five countries. That's not even a global figure. Um, we can save over 100 billion US dollars. That's just the estimated global benefits of ecosystem services, specifically for nature-based solutions focused on climate. And we'll hear, I'll just go into now, nature-based solutions, you know, you've heard about them from climate probably, you've heard maybe they can give us one third of our climate mitigation needs, but nature-based solutions are at the heart addressing societal challenges. So similar to our infrastructure and development needs, nature-based solutions are a, an approach for addressing climate change, whether adaptation or mitigation, it's addressing disaster risk reduction, economic and social development, human health, food security, water security, and uh, ecosystem degradation and biodiversity loss. Now, we've all heard the word, and when my grandmother asks me, you know, Daisy, what are you working on at the moment? I generally explain it, well, nature-based solutions are about working with nature for the benefit of nature and people. So uh, more to the infrastructure sector, this is about building with those biodiversity building blocks, but to answer very human issues, human needs. So the IUCN definition from 2016, which was endorsed by our considerable membership that includes countries, NGOs, indigenous peoples, etc. IUCN defines nature-based solutions as actions, this is taking on the ground actions, to protect, sustainably, sustainably manage, and restore. Now, so it's not just about conservation, this is about managing ground land, this is about managing uh, cities, agriscapes, and it can also be restoring both natural or modified ecosystems. So really emphasizing, we're not just talking about nature-based solutions in beautiful coral reefs and forests. This is about, let's be honest, the majority of our world, which is actually a very modified ecosystem uh, being impacted by human change. And I've already said nature-based solutions address very societal challenges. This is about serving us, but by working on our relationship with nature. It does so effectively and adaptively because it's got to work at the end of the day, if you're looking at reducing flood damage or even the risk of harm to your family along the coast, you want a solution that's effective, cost effective as well, and you need it to be adaptive to predictions uh, that are variable, such as climate change predictions. And it has to simultaneously provide human well-being and biodiversity be be benefits, so helping people and nature. Now, before I, that's unpacking the definition for you there, quite quickly. So before I go into, you know, well, so what? That sounds wonderful. It obviously hasn't worked fully in the past because we're still in a bit of a mess. So what can we do to mainstream them? How can I get them into policy? How does this affect my decision making? Here are just a couple of tangible examples of what those actions can look like. On the left, uh, that's a forest in Switzerland. This is our favorite example to use since we're based, uh, our headquarters are based in Switzerland. These are so-called protection forests. We live in a mountainous country uh, where you know, a lot of people travel through roads that are quite high and are at risk of landslides, rock fall, erosion, et cetera. Now, for some of that protection, we use gray engineering, which can have quite a high maintenance cost. And so Switzerland, a proportion of the road tax goes into what they call protection forests. 
management of healthy forests up and downstream of these roads to reduce that cost of maintenance on gray engineering, but also to protect the people and um, infrastructure. I also just wanted to point out in Vietnam that this can look, it doesn't have to be just based around gray engineering. This can be based around things like agricultural needs. This is about um, sustainable management of a wetland landscape, but for agricultural output. And a quick touch on one of the largest nature-based solutions examples that we know of, uh, beyond, of course, the management of indigenous lands by indigenous people, the very original nature-based solutions experts, the restoration of the lowest plateau in China, which you can see the before and after photo there, but what you can't see in that photo is a huge amount of economic development it brought into that region, especially in terms of jobs. So, one other point that I'd like you to take home from this presentation is that nature-based solutions, it might be a new word. Yes, we defined it in 2016, and right now it's very popular, but it's building on decades of work based on science and experience and real people, whether that is forest landscape restoration, um, things like green engineering or natural engineering, ecosystem-based adaptation. What nature-based solutions does is freeze out that knowledge and experience and lessons from the different sectors and collects them under an umbrella that covers a multitude of effective solutions. This is not a one size fits all situation. This is, we have a lot of different contexts and we need the most cost effective solutions. Why is this so important for you to take away and spread this word? Because we need to mainstream nature-based solutions to realize their potential, we need a strong evidence base and business case, which means we need to accurately be able to identify how they differ from certain other solutions that perhaps don't benefit biodiversity. So here's a little bit of a typology for you. Uh, we need all the solutions we can get. We need to de-invest from fossil fuels, for example, that nature-based solutions are not an excuse to, for any other commitments. But there are other things such as nature-inspired solutions. The word there you might remember is something called biomimicry. This is, for example, designing a coastline barriers based on the shape of coral reefs, but it's still not necessarily based on the healthy functioning of that coral ecosystem. So it's being inspired by nature, but doesn't necessarily support the nature that inspires it. Nature derived solutions are things like renewable energy or biofuels. Another important component of our transition to a, a carbon net zero future. However, they're nature derived because the resource, wind or even um, the fats from crops for biofuels, they come from nature. But again, for a wind farm to work effectively, it doesn't need a healthy ecosystem. So nature derived solutions while important are not nature based solutions. Nature-based solutions such as this giant coastal management in Brazil, a huge mangrove forest that protects people there because it decreases storm damage and storm waves. Nature-based solutions go back to that healthy society and healthy nature ecosystem in one place. Now I know I've only got another four minutes, but believe me, I have this down pat because you may be thinking, well, okay, I'm, I'm sort of sold on this, but how, how do we tangibly do this? How do, we not, how do we protect from greenwashing? How can we find the strong solutions? How, we can, how can we design new ones? And if we have some strong nature-based solutions, how can we scale them up to the point where they can be invested in, in, in significant finance um, investments? So I'd like to introduce you briefly to the IUCN Global Standard for Nature-Based Solutions. This was not a standard that was by any means created in a small dark room by five people. Uh, we did a crowdsourcing mechanism. We talked to 800 people across 100 countries, looking at different sectors, including the sustainable infrastructure sector, including engineers, with thousands of comments that we tracked to come up with this standard that is really a facilitative standard. This is not about policing the term and kicking out people that don't have the perfect nature-based solution. This is about bringing sectors on board, the agriculture sector, different sectors, so that we can really realize the potential of a healthy relationship with nature. Now, what do I mean when I say standard? Some of you will know uh, the matrix and inception of standards out there. 
The backbone of this standard is based on eight criteria that I'll take you through quickly. At the heart, we've already talked about this, nature-based solutions are criteria one, they address societal challenges. This is about addressing development needs of people. Criteria two, nature-based solutions have to be designed at scale. That doesn't mean they have to be a massive project like in Brazil. This can also mean just working on, you know, uh, restoring or managing a part of a wetland, but you have to design it thinking what's happening upstream, upstream what's happening downstream, uh, what can affect or my, my project and what can my project affect. Of course, nature-based solutions are built on the three foundations of sustainable development. They have to um, be built on biodiversity net gain, uh, economic feasibility, that can mean making a profit, and they have to be inclusively governed and work with the people. So that's nature, economy, and society. As good as that win-win-win scenario sounds, we have criterion six, there are gonna be trade-offs. Who has to pay today for us all to win in the future? And because we're dealing with very complex systems, economies, societies, and ecosystems, this has to be adaptively managed, no matter how much science and local knowledge you take into account, especially in the face of climate change, your project has to be adaptively managed, your nature-based solution. And finally, nature-based solutions are moving away from that project approach. This is not about going in for three years and dumping a bunch of money and then leaving. This is about thinking about how can, you, how can the ecosystem be set up to keep providing those benefits um, outside the timeline of, let's say, a project. So building a sustainable, self-sustainable system, if you may, like those projects and roads, uh, those forests and roads in Switzerland. Okay, so then just very quickly, this is what the standard looks like for those of you that like to see it in front of you. The standard is actually a small booklet with those criteria and indicators and then a lengthy guidance document where you can get a little bit more scientific information on why those criterion and indicators are important. To give you just a brief taste, here is criterion three about biodiversity net gain. Each criterion has a subset of indicators where then as part of a self-assessment, you can rate that indicator as, do you match it strong, adequate, insufficient, uh, partial or insufficient? And once you've done that, you can have an output of whether you're in adherence with the standard, you can identify the weaknesses and the strengths of your intervention and communicate that with your community. One final thing is that in this standard or this version of the standard, all eight criteria are equally weighted. And to be in adherence, you have to at least partially address all eight. So at least all have to be orange. If even one is insufficient red at the criterion level, you are not in adherence with the IUCN Global Standard. We have piloted this, and where some people are not in adherence, they actually uh, are, then work with us also to improve that intervention in some cases. So I'll leave you here with this slide, uh, just with some of the examples of where we've applied the standard and the handover to questions. Thank you, Daisy, for the wonderful introduction to the standard. And um, please look at the look in the chat. There's a couple links both to the standard um, and the guidance, so you can learn more and really think critically about how we can use this standard in our work going forward. Um, so, Daisy, we did get one quick question, but before I ask you that, I want to invite you all to go back to the Mentimeter, um, and we have one question set up in poll two. And that is, um, I'm gonna share my screen so you, you can see what you should see when you click there. The question is, have you seen or heard of nature-based solutions in relation to these types of projects? And there's a handful of different infrastructure type projects there. So we're just curious, how far are nature-based solutions kind of getting into our conventional infrastructure um, types of projects? What are we seeing? What are we, um, kind of observing is happening out there. So Daisy, the question that I have for you quickly, and you mentioned kind of the importance of definitions, right? Um, and one of the words we hear about or things we hear about is natural capital. So how would you kind of define or describe natural capital as it relates to maybe nature-based solutions? 
Absolutely. And there's a, a good graphic from the Nature and Business for Nature project uh, linking natural capital and explaining in the context of nature based solutions. So, if nature based solutions is the framing, the approach that you take to solve these challenges, natural capital is the the valuing of the resources there. So natural capital is looking at what are your, what is the value of your forests, of the soil, of the water in your system. Uh, so in my head, because I, I love metaphors, you know, when I talked about those three criteria, nature, economy, and society, I think of them as bricks. They're the bricks you're building their nature-based solutions out of. Natural capital is one of the ways of valuing that brick and also valuing the output of the nature-based solutions at the end. Mm -hmm. But that it, that's a very simplistic overview, and it's actually a big piece of work with the Natural Capital Coalition to really untangle all those uh, little little separate parts. That's great. Thanks, Daisy. Appreciate that. And um, I'm going to quickly share my screen again and see the results that have come in on that second poll question. So again, this is, have you seen or heard of nature-based solutions in relation to these types of projects? So it looks like most we've heard um, kind of linked to water management type projects and then next down to buildings. So maybe, yeah, paste in the chat if you had a particular type of nature-based solutions that was linked to buildings. I know green roofs come to mind for me, but would love to hear for others. Um, and similarly, what types of projects and water management are you thinking of? Um, and the, the one we wanna share next in our case study is related to transportation. And so with that, it's um, my great pleasure to introduce one of my colleagues at Conservation International, um, Marie Claudia Diaz Granados. And Marie Claudia has been working at Conservation International for the last 15 years, most recently as Blue Carbon Director. Before joining the Global Blue Carbon team, Marie Claudia was the Oceans Program Director in Colombia, providing strategic and programmatic leadership replicating and amplifying successes, not only in the Pacific region of Colombia, but also in the Caribbean. She was one of the instrumental project developers for the first ever verified blue carbon crediting project located in Cispata, Colombia. So with that, um, Marie Claudia, I pass it over to you. Thank you, Emily. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me. Let me share my screen. Can you confirm? Awesome. So um, thank you again uh, for inviting me to be here. I'm, I'm going to share with you um, a project we have been working together with Emily. I have to say she, she's the, the, the mind behind everything. Uh, but together with other partners, nas nationally speaking, Autocase is, is one of our um, great ally partners here. They are from Canada, but in at national level in Colombia, we were working with INBEMAR, which is the National Research Institute, as well as with Tras, Tras La Perla. I'm going to let you know who's, who are they. And uh, a couple of university, one of those is the University of Los Andes, another is University of Magdalena, and a group of engineers that help us building up this structure. We will present this case study as an example of a combination of three main principles of sustainable infrastructure. And it is, it is important to stress that we are not in, at the implementation stage, but at the initial planning process and trying to adjust existing conditions of the infrastructure project. But what is uh, the Cienaga Grande de Santa Marta um, is the uh, largest wetlands in the country, uh, in the Caribbean region. I'm going to show you later a map. It is composed of several lagoons uh, connected by channels, alluvial plains, and sandy barrier in its northern section. The Cienaga Grande de Santa Marta receives inflow from the Magdalena River and the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, which is one of the largest mountains we have in the Caribbean coast uh, in Colombia. It is the most productive lagoon in the tropics due to uh, its hydrogeochemical and biological features. And it's also home of a variety of fauna and flora, including commercially important fish species 
on which more than 3,000 fisher folks depend. This is the map I wanted to show. It's, uh, it's located again in the Caribbean region of Colombia in South America. And in the 50s, the construction of the highway along the Salamanca Island, which is this red line that you can see in the slides, obstructed the natural water circulation between the Cienaga and the Gulf of Salamanca. In the 70s, a highway and control dikes along the eastern border of the Magdalena River, you can see my mouse here, um, were constructed, reducing also the freshwater flow from the Magdalena River to the Cienaga Grande de Santa Marta. In 1995, mangrove forest uh, cover extended only 230 something square kilometers, less than 50% of its original cover, with eutrophication events and the deterioration of commercial fisheries species affecting the subsistence of fisher folk dependent on the Cienaga Grande de Santa Marta. There is a proposal right now uh, to refurbish and expand the highway. The proposed gray conventional approach is only including a highway widening in both sides along 42 kilometers and the construction of two elevated roadways in two prioritized areas based basically on erosion impact coming from the sea towards the inland and seriously affecting the existing highway. It is basically expanding the existing highway without including any environmental consideration. The study area in, in this case extended along the 49 kilometers of highway that connects the cities from Barranquilla to Santa Marta. And we divided the study area into eight different sectors through stakeholder consultation and infrastructure existing projects. Oh, sorry. We develop here with our partners a green gray alternative to widening the highway that improves the connection between the marsh and the ocean and restores mangroves and compare the social, environmental, and financial cost and benefits of the proposed gray only project to the green gray alternative using a model that is called triple bottom line cost benefit analysis. Uh, the connection of the TBL CBA to the IUCN standard is through criterion sec second or two, which include the ability of projects to integrate interaction between economy, society, and ecosystems. Six synergies across sector sectors and also considers risk beyond just the project site. Our green gray proposal is a combination between gray conventional approaches alongside the highway and green solutions to restore the mangrove forest and its ecosystem services for communities. We don't want to lose the opportunity in the country to do things in a better way. And that is why we decided to propose this innovative approach that will cost almost 50% less and it will provide environmental, economic and social benefit in the near future. Our gray, green gray solution includes elevated roadways located in um, areas where we, were, we are restoring the old channels, the old existing channels. Wildlife crossing corridors in sensible areas, especially close to the national protected area to reduce or minimize uh, traffic accidents with wildlife and obviously uh, to reduce economic losses. Design coastal protection strategies to restore sand dunes as an alternative to reduce erosion and impact from sea level rise. And also installing poros embankments in specific areas to guarantee the hydrological flow, which is basic. This is, these are some of the results and, and they are showing um, or suggesting that the economic potential of the green gray highway, highway design are enormous. The social and environmental benefits that we analyze are um, over two billion US over 55 year analysis. This high number is largely owing to the expected increase in mangrove co cover, approximately 70% approximately of the benefit of the project can be derived from the ecosystem goods and services provided by mangrove. Adding to the life cycle cost benefit analysis of the green gray design, um, we 
overall, we can see that the uh, total net cost at present value is up to 2 billion US dollar over five, five, uh, 55 years. And you can see the numbers here, everything is, expla is explained um, in the report, the final report. And if you want, we can, well, we are also writing a paper and soon we can be able to share that information with you. All these benefits are so large for multiple reasons. And one of that reason is the uh, increase in mangrove cover, as I was mentioning before. Uh, and that increase is substantial. More than 70,000 hectares can be restored only by um, implementing this green gray solution. Even if the El Nino event causes contraction in mangrove cover every seven years, more or less, that means that we can have a restriction of 50% of the, um, the um, model information. These declines in mangrove cover are also are on average, they grow, the, the net grow of the mangrove, it's, it's about 344 hectares every year, taking into account that discount included uh, into the model, which means that um, the results are very significant. We also um, compare or did a comparative analysis with the SDGs, and this is uh, what we see, the, the green gray solu solution has a potential to contribute to 11 of the 17th SDG and to 39 of the 169 SDG targets. It is especially important to SDGs 9, 13, 14, and 15. As lessons learned, we have a lot, uh, and, and please remember that we are in the planning and design phase of the project not on the implementation stage, but we have some um, technical challenges in identify. There are limited experience in the countries where green gray solutions were implemented, uh, though the capacity, the existing capacity is limited. Uh, the National Infrastructure Agency is developing a, substantial, a sustainable infrastructure pillar as a part of the strategy. And there are too many government organizations involved with not environmental criteria. And the conventional approach used usually it's easier and common. Those are the technical challenges. Regarding governance challenges, uh, we, we have identified that the Cienaga has too many environmental and territorial governance entities, and that creates a lot of uh, problems in coordination. And um, there, is an, there are no national policies to develop sustainable projects. And finally, uh, the financial or economic, economic change, challenges are, um, we believe that there is, the problem is not the lack of funding, but how those funds are distributed. And also we have been promoting the idea of a regional and eco, an eco-regional approach of this, to the Siena Grande Santa Marta, but it's very difficult to promote and we are still working in silos, I have to say, because this is like a quasi public good, good and you need to educate uh, first the environment who has decision power and then educate also private sector who will build and um, potentially own the project. Finally, uh, we have some lessons learned, um, but we, we can say that we increase the awareness about alternative structures or strategies to meet goals for both resiliency and ecosystem restoration. We also influence design for future projects with the active participation of this team within the um, different um, workshops and events organized by the uh, National Infrastructure Agency that is right now developing um, a sustainable infrastructure pillar within their own uh, structure. And finally, we believe that there is a room for applicability and demand in other uh, areas in Colombia and, and also in other countries. And this is why CI is right now the, considering the potential of developing a tool that, that streamlines or perhaps facilitates the analysis so it can be more accessible to users, 
like governments and decision uh, and design professor, pro professionals. Sorry. Thank you so much. And uh, I think I use my 12 minutes, but if there are questions, I am uh, ready to answer. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Marie Claudia. That was uh, terrific, really interesting. Um, there are a couple of questions here, and also if folks have questions that they want to put in the chat right now, that would be great. Um, we will have time for a couple right now, and maybe we can also discuss some later afterwards when we come back after the breakout. But um, my first question for you is um, whether a cost-benefit analysis like this also lines up in terms of issues like greater transparency and inclusion and participation. How do they link up? Yeah, this this um, this methodology it's it's bring together different stakeholders, and that that is how we can guarantee active participation. As I stress out, we were um, in the design phase, uh, meaning that we used all existing information to construct this um, this study. Uh, and, and as Emily was mentioning just before we start this webinar, this is a pandemic research. So we were not able to go uh, and visit the area and share everything with the local communities where, that are key stakeholders. If this can come through, then we have to go there and include them as decision makers as well, because they are the ones that um, needs to have a voice at the end uh, because they are living around the, um, the highway, but also using the services from the mangrove areas. That's one, that, that is a very important aspect to, to consider, but using this TBL, uh, CBA model, we can have these tools to bring everyone together and make a transparent and, a, and a clear and coherent design uh, for a, 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 a sustainable infrastructure project. I don't know, Emily, if you can, if you want to add something because you are part of this study as well. <laughs> that was perfect, Marie Claudia, thank you. And can, can you also tell me um, where you are in the process as far as the decision-making goes? Are, have you, receive responses from those folks who will actually be deciding what will be built and what will be done? And what is the time frame? Do you feel like you're racing against the clock? How can you give a little bit more uh, feedback of where you are in the process and what you're hoping will happen next? Yes, yes. We, we have um, shared these results with many stakeholders at local, regional, and national level. We also, something that I didn't mention is that one of the partners uh, that is part of this um, project uh, is um, Tras La Perla Foundation. That Tras La Perla is owned by one of the most popular Colombian singer, Carlos Vives, and he's been doing a, a great awareness campaign at national level uh, to make people understanding that this is a very important and priority project for the country, which open us uh, a lot of doors in different levels of decision makers within the government, but also within the public. And something that we have heard many times is that they, they had no idea that taking an environmentally focused approach could be cheaper than developing a great conventional infrastructure. This is very important because uh, that's one way for the country of ex spending less money and doing a better, um, having a better approach, sustainable approach with, with many co-benefits, cool social, environmental, and economic. And so uh, one of the questions in the chat is, is this proposal actually been a 
approved for implementation? It is, um, and who would approve it? Not yet. That's that's our goal. Okay. It's not yet approved. Uh, there are some existing um, projects ongoing um, that are that were approved previously, uh, like a couple of years ago, and they are also designing something different. What we want is basically changing the existing approvals, legal approvals. And, and that's a, a very difficult uh, process to do. And that's why we are connecting or we are contacting high level people within the government to make that this happens because it's, it's basically, and I have to say, it's absurd not to use this kind of uh, design when you see uh, so much benefits from only um, constructing uh, a highway in a better manner. So I think uh, they all know we are closing this governmental phase. We, we still have one year uh, to get those approvals. And, and I am very confident that we will have that very soon. Great. Crossing um, our fingers. <laughs> and let me, there's just one more really interesting uh, question here. Boy, there are a lot of questions now coming in, which we're going to have to answer either in the chat or afterwards. But just one last question is, what are the risks of a project like this? Hmm. Not doing it. It's, it's <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. We can, we can discuss all this more. There's some great information that's also coming through in the chat. We will be sending you all of the, the whole chat and all these links in an email, uh, a follow-up email from this. So don't worry about us losing some of these and we can answer some of these questions again afterwards. But I think um, those last comments lead in perfectly to our breakout session. And that is we've heard, um, Emily, do you want to go ahead and share the screen with the breakout questions? We've heard about the importance of um, getting uh, the stakeholders, whether they're the people, the local communities, the entire public of say Colombia or the decision makers to understand these concepts and come on board and um, some interesting ideas, Marie-Claudia, that you had with bringing in um, artists and you know high profile people to help pitch it, but we're interested in ideas that folks might have on how uh, we can rally support amongst stakeholders for this and either specifically ideas for this Columbia project, this highway project, or if you have ideas of or examples that you've been involved in anywhere in the world at the local to national or international level, we're interested in hearing them. And the second question is what opportunities could you have to innovate uh, nature-based solutions in your work? So we're gonna break into groups breakout sessions and think about these questions. If you have thoughts while you are, are talking, please put them into the Mentimeter under the questions because we're gonna be collecting them and collating them. Either do it during your session or please at the very end, go ahead and do it. Also, before you leave us, don't forget, please fill in your post-session survey, you'll get your certificate of attendance. And we are gonna be breaking out for, I think roughly 12 to 15 minutes. I don't know exactly how long, 10 to 15 minutes, um, probably closer to 12. So um, Sarah, why don't you go ahead and uh, put everybody in. Thank you to both Daisy and Marie Claudia for excellent presentations. Um, really a lot of fodder for great discussion in our breakout sessions. All right, welcome back everyone. Um, in our last 
couple minutes here together, I just want to share with you some of the reflections that were captured in the breakout rooms um, that folks entered. So in this First question, um, so now that we have this compelling cost-benefit analysis for the roadway project in Columbia that Marie Claudia shared, how might we rally public and decision-maker support? So some of the, the suggestions were about intensifying awareness and advocate, advocacy initiatives, lobby decision-makers in all areas of policy, um, learn from other projects, stakeholder engagement, highlight the possible development of the rural area because of the proposed project. Yeah, this is key. The, the decision makers will kind of follow public support. So kind of raising awareness and understanding within the public uh, about the importance of the type of investment that might be going forward. Um, one of the things that was uh, mentioned in, in my group is that unfortunately, many of public in the public don't feel or know the effects of a bad infrastructure choice until it's too late, it's already been built. Um, social media, again, is a great tool. I'm gonna Skip to the next question here, which is what opportunities could you have to innovate nature-based solutions in your work? Um, so green building solutions, fantastic. Uh, in Kenya, uh, rapid development of rails and roads in key biodiversity areas and protected areas. So thinking about na nature-based solutions um, as being effective there optimize at the household level nature-based solutions. There's a lot of great resources um, for that in terms of rainwater capture, um, reuse of water, gray water on site. Uh, in, our, in our group, we shared some, some resources or solutions like compost blankets and socks um, that can help clean water and help with habitat um, establishment and restoration. So I know we're just um, at the very last moment here and I wanna share quickly um, the next steps and last items for the webinar. So please complete the post-session survey to re receive a certificate of attendance, connect with us on LinkedIn if you're available or able to, um, that, disregard that one, that's from last month. Um, stay with us if you can for a post session for informal Q&A, or we'll see you next time. And next time, uh, as Lynn mentioned, we'll be focusing on principle five, which is resource efficiency and circularity, which will be on November 10th. And this principle is really about the use of sustainable technologies and construction materials that are planned and designed into infrastructure systems to minimize their footprints and reduce emissions, waste, and other pollutants. And we're really going to be focusing on the connections between carbon and climate. So the carbon, embedded carbon within infrastructure projects and connecting that to the climate crisis that we um, are finding ourselves in. And the timing of our session on November 10th is overlaps with the UN Climate Change Conference, which will be happening in the UK. So that's part of why we want to emphasize, emphasize um, kind of the, the carbon elements of infrastructure and how we can reduce carbon emissions associated with infrastructure, the infrastructure industry. And we'll be um, sharing a tool that's used in the UK on carbon management in infrastructure and a verification process for that. So thank you all so very much for joining today. Thank you to our speakers, Marie Claudia, um, Diaz Granados, Daisy Hessenberger, and Joe Pierce. It's really um, a pleasure to be here with you today and look forward to seeing you again next month. So, and please stay for the next 15 minutes for informal um, question and answer and just catching up. We look forward to talking with you more. All right.
great. <laughs> oh, and we see Yannick and Anna there who are uh, yeah. also been with us in past. Yeah. Thank now, you. <laughs> um, does anybody have, Maria Claudia had to, oh, she's still with us, but may have to leave us early. But if folks have questions, we can pull back from some of these questions that weren't answered during, uh, during the session. But if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask a question of any of the presenters now, go ahead. Okay, so um, I am going to pull out one of the questions I saw earlier for Daisy. If you are there, I don't see you on my screen, but I hope you're still there. Daisy, can you, um, it was asked earlier in the text, what are the countries that have really embraced nature-based solution, not at the individual level, but sort of at the country level? I think she signed off. Okay, we lost Daisy. So Emily, can you help answer that question? Um, I can, I think, and I welcome other people's reflections. I think, you know, the world is obviously a big place. And so I'm most familiar with the countries, I think that where Conservation International is most active and where our program is most active. But, um, you know, I think the Netherlands has been a leader in recent years in coastal protection and integrating um, wetland and coastal restoration. The United States has a strong green stormwater infrastructure effort underway and living shorelines um, programs that is, I'd say, on the cutting edge of things. Um, so th those two, China's um, sponge cities uh is a great i think also a good example of really taking to scale and integrating um nature-based approaches to flood management so those three come to mind what what do you guys think are there other um countries that you know that you think have are, are doing a good job at, and not only doing pilot projects but i think integrating approaches nature-based approaches across uh, kind of all elements of regulations and, and down into implementation. Kamika, I noticed you put in some uh, answers to that right now and also earlier during the session. I wonder if you want to say a word about um, uh, where you, the groups that you are working with right now and where you would look for this kind of information. Oh, um, yeah, I was just actually uh, dictating um, uh, her response. <laughs> so, um, but thank you. Um, I, um, I work um, primarily with Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands uh, for EPA. I do uh, disaster recovery, resilience, um, mitigation, sustainability type work. And, um, and we're, we're doing, um, I, I think some of our challenge is the intersectionality of the different program areas. I, I work in sustainable materials management, but there's a lot of overlap um, into the other areas, um, uh, water, um, coastal zone uh, protection, wastewater, energy, transportation, built environment, so on and so forth. And one of the things we're trying to do is really um, in a very, um, in a very sort of a, a wholesale and organic way, try and um, see where all those interconnections uh, are and see how the resources that are on the island already, many of which are currently um, being disposed, uh, we, we're trying to reframe them as, as commodities as opposed to just you know, waste, um, that if we, we think, um, think more thoughtfully about it, about these materials, how can they be used to address um, some of the environmental um, and human health and um, uh, 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 needs of the um, 
um, of the places where we're working. So how can we use, like for instance, if there's a building that's been damaged from, um, from a hurricane, how can we use the, um, the, the CND, the construction demolition debris, um, the concrete aggregate and so on and so forth um, on the island, perhaps for road beds or drainage or, or what have you. Um, and I think, you know, between the sort of pandemic and just the uh, um, uh, seasonal storms um, that become more and more severe, uh, I think supply chain disruptions are really going to be, you know, a front and center um, of certainly um, islands work, but, you know, I think for everywhere. So I think we have to think about using the materials that we generate on in a particular location much more thoughtfully. And certainly uh, next month when we talk about um, uh, resource use and circular economy, that will we'll come back to a lot of those same issues. Yeah, and if I may, one of the things like one of my passions is reuse. And uh, one of the things we're trying to get going um, that um, a friend of mine, uh, John Wackman, who, who sadly died this year, but um, he started this repair cafes um, in, in the Hudson Valley where I live. And we've got like 40 of them now where people come together and they just bring whatever they have that needs to be repaired um, to a central place where we have these repair coaches, which are just volunteers from the community who know how to fix things. Um, and so it's, um, I mean, it's, it's nothing new, you know, these have been going on for, for gener forever, but um, they're just sort of making it a social event. It started in, um, in the Netherlands and um, um, from Martin Postma started the movement in the Netherlands and we have it here. And I was trying to bring it to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands because after storms, so many things just get tossed, um, uh, even if they're perfectly good because you know they might FEMA will come in and replace so much of these but uh but again with the supply chain disruptions and also you know the 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 tremendous waste that's generated um from these stores and just our lifestyles we really need to rethink how how we manage those materials and have a means to actually repair things because I think the repair infrastructure is really um is is an area that needs to be um is really needs to be focused on in terms of our natural resources. Great, I Chris, you wrote an interesting uh, question about that got back to the Menti, that early Menti poll, um, which sectors people see uh, uh, nature-based solutions and Blake put a nice link up there where there's lots of examples. Uh, Chris asked about the energy and telecommunications. And certainly in energy, one starts to think about um, biofuels. You immediately obviously interact with uh, nature-based solutions, but um, does anybody have any telecommunications uh, examples of nature-based solutions? Nothing in my mind comes, to, Blake, in, from that uh, link, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? I'm going through it now, um, and I don't know if I see a clear telecommunications category. Um, they might, it might be sort of under um, energy or infrastructure, and you may just have to sort of tease out to find a telecommunications example. So it might be in there, but it's not like a, a clear category, it looks like. And, um, for energy outside of biofuels, are there other examples in the more traditional, uh, even fossil fuel energy or renewables? Uh, there, I'm, I'm sure there are. Um, I, don't, I don't know all of them. This is usually just where I go to if I just have a specific thing. Um, in mind, so unfortunately, I'm I'm not an, uh, a spokesperson for Urban Nature Atlas, so so I don't know. Maybe that maybe there's terrible stuff in here. Um, well, I know, but it's a great resource if you have a question. Um, it's easy to to peruse and and find examples. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think um, Budilla's comment is is important too. That there's a lot of um, 
smaller systems that can be more localized. That's that's really important. And I think it was Daisy that mentioned the the, the fine line between nature based and kind of nature drive solutions. So thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I'll mention a oh, I was Go going to mention a couple projects around um, wind energy, which is kind of specific. But there is an example in Pakistan, Pakistan of a wind energy project that's located um, within a mangrove restoration area. And there's a very compelling business case for there was actually an afterthought that made the case for investment in the mangrove restoration as a way to improve the longevity of the roads that were being used to not only as where the pipelines are buried or the energy distribution is <laughs> infrastructure is um, located beneath the roads, but it's also the main access way to the turbines for maintenance. Um, and so the Earth Securities did the that report. If, we can look it up online and put it in the, in the, the ideas for them that are um, using uh, kind of low carbon emission uh, concrete mixes uh, to create coverings for the cables that are for offshore wind as that cable comes into uh, onshore and for distribution. And so the, these kind of concrete structures can be 3D printed and used with um, kind of best, best in class concrete mixes. And the idea is that with the 3D printing, you can achieve these um, small micro habitats that attract uh, natural um, uh, kind of communities to establish on them. So that's a, a version of a nature-based solution, but just instead of dump uh, placing rock on this cable, being more intentional for how those structures are built and placed to be attracting um, nature to them. So. Hello, uh, this is Vincent from Uganda. Hello, Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Vincent. Yes. <laughs> how are you? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd already shared it. I, I don't know, I think uh, you'll correct me. The nature-based uh, uh, projects, especially telecommunication, where my village, where I come from, uh, we have a PG settlement. Uh, over 35,000 PGs coming from the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, but mainly from Southern Sudan. And in this area, uh, the, the refugees were struggling for use uh, cutting trees and uh, and using the trees uh, during the night uh, to warm themselves, campfire, something like that. So what we did now was uh, uh, to work together with the camp leaders and then also the UN Chiara and so on uh, to also to begin installing solar uh, so that they can be able to put solar in their rooftops and then they use at night so that we reduce cutting trees. And then another thing for the telecom, and also they use it because they used to go very far using generator to charge the battery for their mobile phone, uh, laptops and so on. So they also now use the solar, uh, solar system uh, to charge their cell phones, to charge their uh, mobile phone, even others even watch TV using solar project. Uh, project. And then also the women, what we did was also we we advised the UN uh, to buy uh, to buy uh, solar panels so that we could be able to pump water. We set up a system to pump water from a nearby river to water tanks, and these water tanks now distribute water to various sections of the camps, and then it, which is nearer to uh, to the home states, and the women. Those days used to go very far to fetch water so that they don't go very far and then also they don't spend a lot of time uh, looking for water or going far to fetch water. And then also, uh, we also train them to use briquettes, making a uh, briquet something for, as opposed to cutting trees. So they, they, they pick the, the leaves and then also mold it with some soil and then they use it for, for cooking food as opposed to cutting trees. Then also the, the telecommunication companies, they have also now used that uh, model. They are using solar 
to power the bus stations. Because initially, before, they used to have a, a generator. Because this area, there's no uh, national grid, electricity national grid. So what they're using now is the solar instead of using the generators. So they, they have now put solar system to uh, to power their equipment, the communication equipment. Then also another thing they also does is uh, the camber has now used the, especially the trade centers, they have now put solar system. Everything is grid. You don't see uh, use of generator. Most cases, they only use it those solar products. Thank you very much. Uh, if it means possible, one day maybe I can make a presentation and with photos or something like that. Thank you. Thanks, Vincent. That was great. And I think it sort of uh, brings back this idea that nature solutions are not just one form of infrastructure, but it has it can be nature derived or nature assisted, just as Daisy sort of put out. So that's, I think, a great way to end. We have come to the end of our 90 minutes here, so we don't want to keep you all long. But um, this was, I learned a huge amount from the from uh, our presenters and our breakout session, et cetera. Please join us online on our LinkedIn and next month. And thank you all again. Hope to see you November 10th. Thank you. This is great. It was really exciting and inspiring. New friends. <laughs> <laughs>